Today we shall start with a new series of lecture on solid state chemistry. Solid state chemistry is very important and it is of direct relevance of product of commerce. Since this chemistry in the form of inorganic chemistry provides a large number of products which are in commercial use. This includes beginning the uh, includes the search for zeolites and platinum based catalysts that are profusely used in petroleum industry refining industry. Thereafter it has gone to the development of microelectronics devices and thereafter it has gone to the uh, superconductors in 1980. So therefore this is the science that is a backbone of the modern day electronics and modern day uh, large number of other functions. The development of the science, the credit for the development of the science goes to two important persons. One who discovered the X-ray and he was Ms. Dr. William Lawrence Bragg and the one who discovered the reactions of uh, uh, how do they proceed at atomic level and he was Carl Wagner and he is considered to be the person who is said to be the father of the solid state chemistry. Now before we talk of solid state chemistry in detail, I would like to move to first define a little bit what is solid state. You must have studied in your earlier uh, classes. The solid state is nothing but a state of matter. Like the other two states of matter, the liquid and gas. Now solid states generally exhibit certain characteristics that are, that are apart from liquid and gases. It has a number of properties which depends on the properties of atoms and the way in which they are arranged in the, and the forces acting upon them. The, some of the physical and the chemical properties of solid states are they are incompressible meaning that the constant particles is arranged close to each other and because of that there is a negligible space between the constant particles. Solid states are rigid. Solid states are definite, have definite mass, volume and shape. The intermolecular distances of the solid state materials are very short. Due to that the force between the constant particles that is the atom molecules annoyance are very strong. And finally, the constant particles can only oscillate about their mean positions. Now, the solid states, as you all know, is of two types, the crystalline solids and the amorphous solids. The crystalline solids are said to be the one which have a typical geometry. Such type of solids are defined, have a defined arrangement of particles like atoms, molecules and ions and have three dimensional network of crystals in a long range order. Examples of such materials are the common salt, the sodium chloride, the quartz and a very famous that everybody loves is diamond. Such crystalline materials are crystalline solids, they have certain specific properties such as they have a sharp melting point, they are crystalline solids and definite and having typical arrangement of particles. They have, they show cleavage property that is when they are cut into the edges or sharp by sharp tools they split into two places and newly generated surfaces are smooth and plain. They have definite heat of fusion and crystalline solids are an anisotropics. Crystalline solids are true solids. There are different types of crystalline solids. There are four common types, molecular solids, ionic solids, metallic solids and covalent solids. We shall not go into detail because you have already learnt about this in your uh, previous studies. The other state is amorphous state. Amorphous state comprises of those solids which have the property of rigidity and incompressibility. But to a certain extent, they do not have definite geometrical shape or long range of order. Example includes glass, rubber and plastics. Such materials are what we call amorphous materials. They are characterized by the following properties. 
gradually they gradually soften over a range of temperature they are pseudo solids are super cool liquids they have irregular shape they are when they are cut into pieces the sharp edges tools they the two pieces are the pieces formed are with irregular surfaces amorphous solids do not have definite heat of fusion amorphous solids are isotropic as against the anisotropic of the crystalline solids these solids like as amorphous silicon which is one of the best photovoltaic material converts sunlight into electricity with this background let us now move on to the what is solid state chemistry now solid state chemistry is defined in number of ways the simplest definition of solid state chemistry says it is the chemistry which is also known as chemistry of materials or materials chemistry it's a chemistry the study which deals with the study of structure properties and synthesis of solid materials this is the most simplest definition coming to the important definition that has been given by wikipedia which is a free encyclopedia originating from britannica it defines that solid state chemistry also called as material chemistry is the study of the synthesis structure and properties of solid phase materials which are those materials particularly but not necessarily exclusively of non molecular solids therefore it overlaps with solid state physics mineralogy crystallography ceramics metallurgy thermodynamics electronics as uh, material science and electronics with a focus on the synthesis of novel materials and their practization historically as i mentioned to you earlier this owes a lot of credit to uh, sir william lawrence bragg and carl wegner who are the people who have given this uh, particular science the world the benefit of benefit, benefit of which the world is enjoying today now talking about the synthetic methods how this science helps us in this how do we synthesize these materials which form the base of zeolites which form the base of microelectronics which form the base of superconductors there are a number of ways such materials are prepared some of the techniques the names of such techniques are oven technique now oven technique is based on tube furnaces where the temperatures are of the order of 1100 to 2000 degree centigrade here the reaction to be conducted at that temperature requires a special equipment and that's why we use the tube furnaces and such tube furnaces they consist of tantalum tantalum tubes which have the power of resistance of this temperature and can be used for even high temperature beyond 2000 degree centigrade such temperatures at time requires induced diffusion of the reactants and that's why such techniques are used other methods which are used for the synthesis of such materials are melt method where reactants together and then where reactants are melted together and then later annealed in a very gradual way so that it becomes a solidified melt it is this annealing process that determines the process uh, pro, that determines the properties of such a material which is formed from these melts if a material is if the material is volatile reactant then a different procedure is used the third method is solution method where we can use some of the solvents to prepare solids by precipitation or by evaporation at time the solvent used is hydrothermal that is under pressure and temperature higher than the normal boiling point now you all know that how do we receive the how do we reach this higher normal point by the addition of salts and therefore we make use of some solvents in making some of these synthetic materials the last reaction and last series of reaction is the gas reactions now such reactions they react 
the most solids react vigorously with reactive gases like chlorine, iodine, oxygen. Others, from, others form a duct with gases like carbon monoxide or ethylene. So it is this procedure that is also used for making large number of uh, synthetic inorganic compounds which, uh, which gives us stoichiometric information that can, that can be obtained by reaction which helps identify the product. Now there is one very important thing in the case of solid state chemistry is that along with the preparation you have always to follow the characterization. You have to continuously characterize the new phases while they are being formed because it is the characterization of these phases that will enable you to know if you are reaching the required psychometric level of the product that you are looking for. And for this purpose, for this continuous characterization, you use the tools like scanning electron microscope and X-ray diffractometer, both of which are normal equipment nowadays and therefore one need to continuously follow the development of the phases which are taking place through various techniques that one is using to develop the synthetic material. Therefore, once you have done all this, then you go for the final characterization of the material using the above two techniques and the other techniques also. In case you want some information of opt on optical properties, particularly for non-metallic materials, it is possible to obtain such information using ultraviolet and visible spectroscopy. In the case of some semiconductor, that will give an idea of the band gap that one we are looking for in such materials. My dear students, in my last lecture, I had introduced to you the solid state chemistry. This chemistry is entirely based on the crystalline nature of the materials. And in this we had seen, starting with the solid state chemistry, we had seen that there are two types of solids. One is a crystalline solid and others are amorphous solid. And these solids, they have a very important contribution in our life because they provide materials of our daily use like, as I said the other day, zeolites and platinum-based catalysts which are used in petroleum industry. They also provide us microelectronic devices and they also are the base for high temperature superconductivity. And I had said that the father of the solid state chemistry was Carl Wegener, who has, uh, who has really worked very hard and has put this chemistry uh, in everyday use. Now, having done that, we shall today talk of defects in crystals. And before we do that, let us define what is a crystal. Now, crystals are like people. It is the defects in them which tends to make them interesting. What do, what do you understand? This was said by Colin, Colin Humphrey. What do you understand by this? Suppose there's a group of people sitting, like all army men are sitting together. They are wearing the same uniform, same type of, like everything is the same. And all of a sudden you find one Navy gentleman comes or an Air Force gentleman comes with either a white uniform or a what you call blue uniform. All of a sudden you'll find this is changed. That means you'll see it as a absolutely something new and may call it even as a defect. So it, this is what, it is a defect in them which makes the things interesting. So therefore crystals are like people and it's the defect in them which tends to make them interesting. This is what the Colin Humphrey had said and this fact remains true. Now based on this, before we proceed further, let us define what are the crystalline materials. The crystalline materials, 
can be defined. Such materials have a crystal structure in which the atoms are positioned in perfect order pattern which is repetitive over large atomic distance. This is a very important thing. It is a regular pattern and these atoms are in repetitive over a large, over a large atomic structure. Now if some defect happens in this, these defects if happens in such a crystal, they have an important, profound effect, impact on the microscopic properties of such materials. A small defect will lead to what you call big change in its properties. And it's unlike many other things. Even in some crystals, we sometimes create defect to deliberately introduce certain improved properties. So therefore, you see both defects. Defects are sometimes created intentionally to improve the properties of the crystals. Now, how do we... Then the crystals are said to be of two types. The perfect and imperfect crystals. It's very important to understand what is a perfect crystal and what is an imperfect crystal. The perfect crystals means it may be defined as the one in which all the atoms are at rest on their latest position in the crystal structure. Please note, the definition says all the atoms are at the rest, at rest on their correct lattice position in the crystal structure. When is such a structure possible? Such a perfect crystal can only be obtained hypothetically only at absolute zero temperature, which is not possible. So therefore, at all real temperatures, crystals are imperfect. So therefore, you have a clear difference between perfect and imperfect. Perfect crystals are only exist at absolute zero temperatures. Whereas, whereas in all real temperatures, you have always an imperfect crystal. What does it mean? As per the fact that atoms are vibrating, which may be regarded as a form of a defect, a number of atoms are invariably misplaced in real crystals. It is this misplacement that leads to imperfections. And in such imperfections are defects and otherwise perfectly regular atomic array that concerns us here. And this is what we are going to see, how these imperfections occur. Because these imperfections, what we call as defects later, they lead to certain different types of properties. Now continuing with this, what type of defects are present? What could be their concentrations? And how do they affect their properties? In some crystals, number of defects present may be very small, that is less than 1%. For example, if you take highly pure diamond or quartz crystal, the defects in that would be less than 1%. In other crystals, sometimes very high defect concentrations, more than 1% is found. What is the impact of this concentration? Such high concentrations lead to reduction of free energy due to considerable increase in the entropy of the crystal because of the large number of positions which this defect can occupy. Now kindly note here, it leads to reduction of free energy, these defects, due to considerable increase in entropy. You being a student of higher classes, you must have studied thermodynamics. Delta G, that is the free energy is equal to delta H minus T delta S. If delta S increases, and actually the free energy decreases, and that's why you have different properties in them. Now, how do we classify these defects and what type of defects we observe in these crystalline materials? There are a number of schemes proposed to study these types of defects. The two most important schemes that one comes across when you scan through the books and high standard books, these are based on dimensionality, the size of the atoms. 
Second is based on the stoichiometry. So these are the two ways in which one can look into the types of defects that one finds. What are the stoichiometric defects then? In the case of stoichiometry, stoich stoichiometry, you have two types of defects called stoichiometric defects in which the crystal composition is unchanged on introducing the defects. For example, Scottish defect in iron crystal. We, sh we shall see more details a little later. It's a pair of vacant sites an anion and cation vacancy which preserves the electrical neutrality of the material. Second thing that we see in the case of stoichiometric defects are Frankel defects. We shall also learn a little later more about it in the other classification. Also in a stoichiometric defect that involves an atom displaced off its lattice site into an interstitial space which is normally empty and the example of this is silver chloride has predominantly this type of defects. What are the non stoichiometric defects? This is very difficult to define and is basically a part of the solid state physics. What we call in the solid state physics is color centers, color centers in alkyl halides, alkyl halide crystals, an area of solid physics are some of the non stoichiometric defects. They result in a consequence of change in the crystal composition. Change in composition of the crystal can be affected by heating it, heating an alkali metal, halide and vapor of an alkali metal. Example, heating sodium chloride in sodium vapor. It will lead to non stoichiometric defect. Or the second way of creating such a defect is on doping crystals with alivalent, alivalent impurities. That is those impurities atoms which have different valency to those in the host crystal. Example again here is sodium chloride may be doped with calcium chloride to yield non stoichiometric defect or as a solid solution based on the structure of the pure crystal. So this is the way we classify these crystalline material based on stoichiometric basis. The other method of classification is based on dimensionality. Now this dimensionality, if you look at the diagram, you will find zero dimension, one dimension, two dimension and three dimension. Now in each zero dimension is called point defects. This leads to vacancy, interstitial, Frankel and Schottky. These are the names which I had just mentioned in the, in the beginning of the talk as well. In the case of 1D defect, line defects, you have edge dislocations, you have screw dislocations. In the case of surface or imperfect interface 2D classification, you have grain boundaries, twin boundaries and stacking faults. Whereas in the 3D, which is also called volume defects, you have dispersion, you have precipitates, you have inclusion, you have voids. Now what are the point defects? Point defects are the irregularities or deviation in the crystals from the ideal arrangement around the point or an atom in crystalline substance. This may occur, such defects may occur both in non-ionic crystals as well as in ionic crystals. In the case of non-ionic crystals, this leads to the defect called vacancy defect or interstitial defect. We have talked about it earlier also. Now, in the case of ionic crystals, this leads to Frankel defect and Schottky defect. We will know about that details later. Now, what is the vacancy defect? Now, look at the two diagrams that you have. An atom is missing, missing from an atom atomic site which has created the vacancy on your left hand side. Uh, this occurs due to imperfect packing 
during crystallization. What does it mean? That means this happens when the product is being made through the process of crystallization or through the process of annealing. When such a defect is there, this results in decrease in the density of the substance. When such a vacancy exists or vacancy type defect happens, because there is a loss of atomic atom, it results in decrease of density of substance. Number of vacancies def defects depends on temperature. That means this is a temperature dependent phenomena. Maybe at higher temperature you have more vacancies in this. Now this is the second diagram on the right hand side will clearly show a vacancy in the uh, in the form of square where the atom is missing. So this is what called vacancy defect and it leads to decrease in density of this substance. Moving on to the interstitial defects. Now interstitial defects is the, in addition to extra atom within the crystal. Now what it happens is that there is an addition of an extra atom within the crystal structure. Now you look at the diagram. You have a crystal structure. You have a big space between the two uh, sequences if you take from the top or bottom or from the light to left and there is an extra, extra, extra atom that has gone and set in an open space. This addition of extra atom is sitting in the what is called the interstitial space in the crystal. This defect increases the density. Earlier that was decreasing. Now you can very well imagine there was a loss of atom, here there is a gain of the atom, that's why there is an increase of density. This causes atomic distortions and vacancy and institution are both inverse phenomena. They can happen each ways. Coming to the short key defects, which are stoichiometric defects as we have defined it earlier, they deal with pair of ions and cations vacancies. Now look at the diagram that you have. You have a system of pair of ions and cations. Blue are the uh, ions and others disperse the blue, uh, the brown one are the cations. Now if you look at this, in order to maintain electrical neutrality, neutrality as I said earlier in the uh, stoichiometric defect, the number of the number of missing cations and ions are to be equal. Because in the case of Scottic defect, it's a stoichiometric and electrically neutral. So therefore, number of cations and ions has to be equal. It also decreases the density of the crystal because it creates a vacancy. Examples are alkali halides such as sodium chloride and potassium fluoride. Again, coming back to the Frenkel defect, which was designated as stoichiometric uh, defect, it brings cation being smaller get displaced to an interstitial void. As we have seen that this is created due to interstitial void. So as compared to anion, the cation is smaller and this gets displaced to an interstitial, interstitial void. Combination of vacancy and interstitial atoms, it combines both of them. There is no change in the density and the example of this type of crystals are silver iodide and calcium fluoride. Then comes to the next defect, the line defect. What are line defects? How do we define? Line defects are the irregularities or deviation from ideal arrangement in the entire rows of the lattice points. Now see the diagram. You have six rows and each one has six atoms. But in the center, in the row, half the row is missing. Now you see the interatomic bonds significantly distorted in the middle of the system. Therefore, in the immediate vicinity of distortion and leads to distortion lines. And this causes a dislocation. And such a dislocation, in the case of crystal, affects the 
mechanical properties. So line defects are due to the interatomic bonds which are missing in the systems and because of their absence they affect the mechanical properties. Then they have two types of dislocations, line defects, edge dislocation and screw dislocation. The edge dislocation is positive dislocation and a negative dislocation. It is going to happen both ways and as seen in the picture, if you look at it, you will find that there are certain, certain part of the squares are missing which is leading to both leading to edge dislocation. In the case of uh, screw dislocation, the letters are atomic planes follows helical or spiral along the dislocation line. If you see the second diagram, you see a clear difference. The uh, helical shape is being formed and therefore it's leading to uh, screw-like dislocations in the system. Then we come to the third 2D defects, which are also called surface defects. Now surface defects, if you look at it, Surface defects are associated with boundaries that are separate regions of the material and have different crystal structures. Please understand that such defects are associated with the boundaries of the crystals. And they have, because boundaries have different crystal structures, they have two dimensional effect. Due to change in the orientation of atomic planes, and stacking sequence of atomic planes. That's, that's, that's what leads to the uh, change in orientation. It is caused due to during solidification or mechanical or thermal treatment of material. That means such defects, they start appearing or they get into the system during preparation, when you are doing solidification after melting or some mechanical operation or during heat operation through which this process, the crystal, this material is being made. Now what is the effect of this surface effect? It affects the mechanical properties, electrical resistance and corrosion resistance. So it has enormous effect, the surface defects lead to loss of mechanical properties, loss of electrical resistance and product become more corrosive. Uh, in nature. Then bulk or volume defects. What are they? As I mentioned right in the beginning, these are the three defects and they have four types. Dispersions, you have dispersions, you have uh, Precipitates, you have inclusions and you have voids. And then you have a picture showing the cluster of micro cracks on the, uh, on the slide. What is a precipitate? It's a fri fraction of a micron in size. Now such defects occur during the production of such materials through the process for which they are being made. When it comes to precipitation, naturally, it is coming from the system when the whole system is being precipitated after cooling or after crystallization or after anneeding, whatever the method may be. So therefore, it is a fraction of a micron in size which gets precipitated along with the crystal and that leads to the precipitative type of volume or bulk defects. Other thing is the dispersions. Now dispersions may be large precipitates, the precipitate that you have seen in the first part, if their size becomes larger, they turn into dispersant, they may be grain, they may be polygranular particles distributed throughout the microstructure of the material. Now inclusion comes, now the both precipitates and dispersants, they are from within the systems, which are in the form, form of either micron size in one case, and large precipitates in the other case. 
inclusion refers to when you have during this process some foreign particles get into or large big large precipitate particles they get into the system and they cause undesirable harmful effects or create bulk or volume defects in the system when they get included in such systems when then what is the last is the voids now voids are created due to trapped gases when in some systems either the gases involved along as a reactant or gases being evolved due to the heat treatment and when such gases they get trapped in the body of the uh, crystalline material they create voids that means they create entry spaces now creation of void means it results in decrease in mechanical strength the diagram as which i mentioned to you earlier shown in the slide refers to cluster of micro cracks micro means very fine cracks in the melanin granule melanin is a material which has been made and this has these are being seen when they are being irradiated by shorter short laser pulse they are very very fine micro cracks and when these micro cracks are there they result in the decrease in the mechanical strength so such as the defects are called bulk or volume defects and most of them are responsible for loss in mechanical strength before completing the talk on defects let us now talk something else what is called extrinsic and intrinsic defects now these two terms they find place in number of books but they find definition of theirs is rather difficult the extrinsic defects can be defined as the overall effect of doping when sodium chloride is doped with calcium chloride ions increases the number of cation vacancies these vacancies are controlled by impurity level and are termed as extrinsic defects please understand that when sodium chloride is doped with calcium chloride, calcium ions it increases the number of cation vacancies and these vacancies are controlled by impurity level and are termed as extrinsic defects on the other hand the intrinsic defects are those they are by virtue of temperatures in the system for all the temperature above 0 degree k that means absolute temperature there is a thermodynamically stable concentration which we call as Schottky defects or pair of ions such as shown sodium chloride that we have both an ion and a cation so when it had uh, defects happen due to pair of ions such as Schottky defects it leads to the what you call intrinsic defects so this in brief is the story of defects in the crystal structures which have profound effect on its properties and sometime these defects are introduced intentionally to improve property of material which you are looking for in the system thank you